Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Voices of CFMA, Construction Financial Management Association's podcast featuring conversations with industry leaders sponsored by Old Republic Surety. I'm your host, Sal Marino, CFMA's Director of Communications and an Assistant Editor for CFMA Building Profits Magazine. This month, I am pleased to welcome Ryan Cady from DW Companies. If you haven't had a chance to read Rye's article in the January-February 2024 issue of CFMA Building Profits magazine, you might not be familiar with how they are trying to do dirt work better. But hopefully, this podcast can encourage you to dig deeper. Yes, that was a dad joke. Katie, Rye, welcome. Katie, I'm going to start with you. Can you give us a little bit of background about what led you to where you are now? Well, I grew up in the construction industry. I uh, My parents own a trucking company. They also um, own some pits where they do some aggregate production. Uh, I grew up uh, in a ready mix plant um, as well. My parents owned one of those and ended up selling out to a larger corporation. So it was always around um, our, my parents' shop still is on my parents' property. And so that's cool. um, Yeah. So, I mean, I would walk out to the I go to the office every day to find mom and dad. So um, lived and breathed it. My parents really strongly encouraged me to um, get out of the construction industry and move into something with a college degree. And so I went to school to be a teacher, spent uh, 14 years in Forest Lake School District teaching mainly sixth grade. Um, and then the last five years, I was in kind of a curriculum role district wide um, and doing professional development for our educators. Uh, my husband has always been in the excavation world and, um, at his former employer, it was kind of a toxic situation. So he had kept, um, encouraging me to come join his force. Uh, that group of his OGs left, uh, the, the organization and one, including Rise husband and, uh, started their own company. And that's when I kind of joined forces here at DW companies. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Rye. Yeah. Uh, well, I am Rai Boostrom. I have not, uh, I did not grow up in the industry. However, my my dad yesterday just retired after 37 years uh, as an owner operator. So he um, put her in park and now he calls himself semi-retired. No pun intended, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> Very uh, good. <laughs> from that, so that, that blue collar life has always been a part of me. Like my husband works for DW companies as a farm kid, auctioneer, you know, just, I know the, I know the industry in that aspect of it. So um, my background is in special education. Uh, I was a teacher uh, in our local school district. And then I started doing some school counseling tracks and same as Katie have some professional development experience and coaching and and things like that before I started um, doing social media and marketing for DW companies. And then with that, it's, you know, we've kind of used our skills here at DW companies from our education background and implemented some professional development here with our team. So um, we'll talk a lot about like the culture of our team at DW companies. And a lot of it has to do with some of the things that we have implemented just with our skills from education and bringing them to the the dirt world, so to speak. Mm-hmm. One of the requirements I had with Steve is when I joined, as I said, we will do professional development if I'm going to be involved in this. And he was like, mm-hmm, sounds good. Whatever it takes to get you to come run the books. Right. right. And- yeah. Uh, I don't think he really fully understood like what that was going to look like. But um, after the first one, I would say that he was 100% bought in seeing the impact it had on our team. That is awesome. Did you guys meet teaching? No, um, actually, uh, Katie and my husband, Nate, grew up together. Oh, okay. <laughs> Literally like rode the same bus and, you know, so we have a lot of like just local connections and like yeah, we never talked with yeah. we were never in the same district. Um, I guess it was just a commonality Katie that is had... much older than me. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. She's only five years older, but yeah, we were never like in the same school <laughs> or things like that. Yeah, she actually her one of her was it your first date? Yeah. Your first date with Nate was um Steve and myself. They're our wedding. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, all these weird yeah. inner inner connections. Lots of connections. Yeah. As the son of two retired teachers, 
one of the things that strikes me about my parents is that whenever they go out, uh, they run into former students and they, they also never stop teaching. And I feel like you guys bring that to DW companies still, because even though you're not teaching, you're still teaching. <laughs> for no. Sure. no, it's in our blood. I mean, we talk a lot too about like the desire for impact and like so much of why we left education was because we weren't making an impact anymore. And what we're seeing now at DW companies and in this industry and through Culture Academy, like all of all of that is like we're starting to see like a little bit of impact that like we were able to do. I don't want to say like so fast, but like education moves rather slow sometimes when it comes to change. And so for us to be able to like see a little impact and of the work that we're doing, like is like fills our education bucket so much. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, tell me a little bit about the Culture Academy. Yeah. So I'll back up just a tiny bit um, of how it came to be, but um, part of it was we started doing the professional development within our own team, and we are very active on social media. We posted about it. Um, we had an influencer that reached out and was like, what are you guys doing? What does PD mean? And we're like, PD? Like, how do you not know? <laughs> like, this is right. professional development. And she was like, oh, well, where do you buy the curriculum? Like, where do you, where do I find this? And we're like, oh, well, we, we just kind of make it depending on what we see our team has for needs and areas of growth. And so we do the research and find the materials and build the curriculum. And she was like, oh, well, where can I buy this? And we were like, all right, well, this is just kind of an normal <laughs> thing. And, right. and then I think Rye responded back with. Well, at that point, like, so we are also the repurposed educator. Yeah, we, yes, we have a job at DW Companies, but we have this thing called repurposed educator. And that's where this culture academy is coming from. And repurposed educator had always been like this idea and like this almost like, vision board thing that Katie had, had coined us repurposed educators from, you know, now that we've landed in this industry. And so uh, we talk about one of one of my things as I was like learning how to be the social media marketing person in the dirt world was creating this logo just on a whim uh, out of Katie's idea. And so it was, we, we coined the term really, but th then I responded to this girl. I'm like, well, actually we have this thing called <laughs> repurpose educator and we're, th we're going to be doing it, but just stay tuned for now. And like, that was like a little bit of bait that she wanted, right. I guess. And then all of a sudden Katie and I had to really like, it, it was just the push that we needed to actually create something really like, like we were talking about checklists before, like it just, falls to the bottom, right? Like some of the tasks that you have and you want to get to and want to do just continues to fall to the bottom. And, and as we're like building DW companies, mind you, it's only three years old. Like, like we're in the meat and the grind of it, the day to day, like it, it was just a five-year plan at that time. And then and then, then she was yeah. like, let's meet for lunch. Let's talk about this thing. And we're like, okay. So <laughs> Ryan and I spend like the entire weekend like putting together uh, a website and like yeah. putting together like the framework of like what we actually are yeah. and we meet with her and she was like you need to be speaking at con at con, at con expo and we're like it's february that's in march and she's like yeah but it's not gonna happen for another three years and we're like uh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and it, it sounds like it all like was created really fast but that is I mean it was two years in the making at that point right. like we really had just taken everything that we had done at DW companies and implemented and was intentional about at DW companies and that was repurposed educator like that was a lot of the work that we were already doing so we just had to organize it and like make it into the thing right mm -hmm. so um we sat down and we just listed all of the things that we talked about in, in our article with you, like all of the community events, the professional development, the emphasis on team building, the branding, the like all the things. And those naturally fit into four themes, which, well, those four themes really. Um, 
And that kind of became our four pillars uh, for culture building. So yeah, it, it was really just the push that we needed to make it into something and make it into what it is. We had accountability now yeah. to like in a yes. month. Um, yeah. and, and then uh, we got approached afterwards, like, well, where, like, where are we going to be able to like purchase this stuff? Where are we going to be able to like take classes from you guys? Like what? And we were just like, I don't know. That's a great question. Like we just survived this like speech. <laughs> um, we'll get back to you on that. Yeah. And so we really went back and did we our homework. So excited to be able to share our story and share what all the things that we knew we were doing and, you know, share our story to people who like thought it was just mind blowing. <laughs> like all of these things were just so natural to us. And like, it was really like out of the box thinking for our industry. And I think that was really like an aha moment. Like okay, we actually do have something really cool and really different here. Mm -hmm. And so when we got back from Con Expo, <laughs> like it was just like, where do we go from here? And we we took, we did take some time, like, cause we didn't, we wanted to actually like know what the industry wanted or what, what they needed. So we took a, a couple months kind of off and kind of just posting a little bit more and sharing our story and what we're doing and asking um, people like what yeah. do you want this to look like how, how do you want to you know learn about this and from um kind of our exposure at conag that we had you know we had a larger audience like we weren't going to be able to just run this thing in minnesota like we would have to build some sort of platform that would um, be able to be nationwide and so mm -hmm. we really did all a ton of research a ton of homework on like what the platform would look like and how to do this and so that we were doing this once in the right time in the right way and so we kind of set out kind of our um, planning long-term planning of of building it and we had weekly and monthly goals and um, but mind you we're also doing our full-time job at DW yeah. so this is a passion project yeah. on the side that we're setting aside a couple hours each week to do and um, a lot of weekends um, yep. into that just because we were so passionate about doing it our, ourselves that um, we arrived at the end game and it was all put together with a little bundle and um, but those last few weeks of like getting people to sign up you know that's where it starts like are people actually going to sign up? Is somebody even going to care? Like, I know people talk and say they want this, but they will they actually commit to doing Culture Academy? And so to have our first cohort full was mind-blowing because yeah. uh, we, we, got, we got two people. We were going to be jumping up and down like, wow, two people believe in like what we are doing. Um, but it's been a really, really great learning experience for us. We are We have just hit the halfway point of our cohort and it is 14 weeks. Um, it takes them through the four pillars that Rai talked about. And really there's a live each week. Um, there's three co uh, individual coaching sessions and there's literally accountability through the whole thing. And by the end, they're expected to have done specific things and implemented specific things in order to quote unquote, get their certification. Um, and that is important for us as educators that there's impact, right? Like we right. can put on yeah. a great, cool thing and rah, 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 get people really excited. And then they go back to their company and it sits off to the side, like good intentions. Like I really want to mm -hmm. do it, but like where I talked about it just falls, falls, falls. So we ask for like a two hour commitment each week, one on uh, an hour of live and an hour of implementation, whether that's meeting with your team or doing work in the background to implement the four pillars that when they walk away, they feel like they got something out of this experience rather than just like, I got really excited and then I put it off to the side, like a lot of other things in our industry. Mm -hmm. So our, we crave impact, like Rai said. And so we want to make sure that it's impactful when people walk through this process with us. That's amazing. And I love that you built like a website on the weekend and was like, here, I did it. And it seems like it fell into place so wonderfully. It really was like perfectly imperfect. Like, I mean, it, I mean, yeah, I don't even think uh, the lady that the influencer that kind of reached out like knew that we had like spent the prior weekend to like 
<laughs> really here actually we we've, we've been doing that you know so we laugh about that now and and you're the probably imposter syndrome right right yeah yes probably yeah. like only the second person sal that actually knows that whole story so now it is we don't let me and let too many people know that to begin with because we're like we but go, that's the thing though there's no shame in that because it's it's what i feel like and when i was in college i used to write all the papers, the last minute, like I, I waited, it, I had plenty of time. I had the ideas, but it was that deadline it, that pushed yeah. me over the, the finish line. And I feel like some people just work the best that way. And if that's a, that's how you work, then that's how you work. And it's, it, there's no, I, mean, I feel like there's no I shame in that. That's, that's how I work. That's definitely not how any work. <laughs> I am a scope sequence so, and yeah. plan and we're gonna so, have this done by this date like literally if it wasn't for the deadlines that she set throughout the, the eight months eight or nine months that we took to to really build culture like it probably you know I, I'm so thankful for her and like we both we have another uh gal on our team too she does the technology like we just we all just work really well together and, and like you said that that those deadlines are definitely key <laughs> Well, and it's just three different skill sets yeah. that are brought to the, you know, the table. Like she is super creative where I'm more of a get shit done person. I need the, you know, when, um, she's very, uh, Erica is extremely, um, techie. So mm -hmm. she figures out all the techie stuff. So we all have this common goal and idea, but we have different strengths that we bring to the table, which has made it successful. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about talent acquisition and retention. How do you feel that DW companies differs from the rest of construction in that regard? Yeah, well, I hear all of the time, and especially people that walk in our office that maybe there are other subcontractors and things in the same industry. Um, and they're just like, how do you find all these good people? Like, you guys are so lucky. And we're like, well, we might be blessed, but we're not lucky. Like this didn't right. happen on accident like there's been a lot of really intentional work that has went into this yes we don't have an issue attracting people um and we do believe it's because of the four pillars it's not just one thing that we've done because people walk in wanting the magic like wand to like wave and right. like fix that issue <laughs> and we're mm -hmm. like it didn't happen overnight like you really have to build something that people want to be a part of what we know about the research on Gen Z's, they want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. They want to be part of something that impacts their community. And so what are you doing to produce that as a company on top of doing really great excavation work, right? And so um, we really have worked hard on being involved in schools, um, attracting the next gen. We talk about look at the military, look at the colleges, look at the tech schools that spend an enormous amount of time um, trying to attract talent to their their structures or their organizations. And we need to be doing the same in our industry. And so within 30 miles of our school, there's, there's not hardly a school district that we're not involved in. Um, we sit on several different construction boards um, to make sure that we're giving our opinion about what we want um, kids to come out of school with to be ready to be a part of our workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it's also your brand, like you're really bringing that right. brand out there that people are proud to wear our stuff. In fact, like a lot of people that come, they're like, uh, oh, well, at my last place, we only got like three shirts and we only get three shirts like each year. And then we have to buy them. Our team room like that we have for people to eat lunch in or meet or just hang out in is is full along the edges of merch and it's a, you can take whatever you want like every day like just take what you want what you need what you want to give to your family and your friends like that's cool because you think about the money we spend on campaigning around you know at ads or social media or all of the, those things are really expensive if i can have people wearing my brand out in my local community and and, and excited to rep my brand like what does that say to my local community in comparison to a paid ad or a billboard that you just bought, you know? So um, we invest a ton of money into our branding and merching. Um, it's also been called the 
under armor of uh, Cambridge XNA schools because like it's a rite of passage to have like a DW sweatshirt at school. Mm -hmm. And what, maybe we'll get a couple out of the high school that come and want to work for us. But the fact that is that everyone's excited about that, um, our brand. And we're, we're showing also that it's really cool to go into our industry. It's not, you don't have to just go to a college or have to go to the, some of these other things that um, we're competing with, that people want to be a part of the excitement with our brand. So that's where I feel like we really kind of set ourselves apart is really being involved outside of our organization. Um, and that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of energy and a lot of commitment from our team um, because it's not just Ryan and I. We have team members out there from the field that are out and involved in these things, but they love it, you know, because they're part of the buzz. Right. Yeah. And don't you guys have trading cards for your employees? We do. Yeah, <laughs> we do. We uh, use them often while the trading cards to have a, their headshot on them, but then also like a statistic of the trades. Um, so we use them a lot for like our uh, parades and um, like events that we're giving out other things uh, just as a little. There are superstars, you know, right? Yeah, there are. And, you know, I, one of the first things when people complain about not being able to find help when they walk in the door here, I ask them, what is your involvement in the school district? And they're like, well, I'm like, okay, there's your next gen coming up. Like, how are you going to excite them? And how are you going to even just let them know that that's an opportunity for them? Um, in in the past, we have not, we the trades have kind of been shut. You know, the door was kind of shut on us as we push everybody to go in, into college. And, you know, the, a great example, I, um, Rai's mom was a school counselor and she was, she pushed against the norm. She pushed for the arts. She pushed, pushed for the trades. And, and during a time when, when it was college, 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 college. Yeah, and you can tell her exactly what the yeah, know, her I mean, experience. I mean, even at that time too, that like even the admin and other counselors were like pushing back against her. Like, this is gonna affect our data. Like, you can't if we don't have kids coming out of the school and going to college. Like, what is our our data gonna look like? You know, and she just she she was one of the I guess forgers that like went went forward and and really encourage students to look into the trades as an option. I think she was really ahead of her time at, mm -hmm. at the time she was a counselor. And so like, we're still battling ramifications of, of that. In, that was part of our generation. It has certainly gotten way better. And I feel like there's a lot of more support for the trades, especially in our area. Um, but we are still dealing with our generation that have kids in the schools right, right now. And our generation was told the only way you're going to survive in life is if you get a four-year degree. So we still have damage control um, to help support the trades as a viable option for people. Very nice. Uh, I hate to break this up, but who just joined us in the background? Someone's uh, popping up and I want... <laughs> Who's this? This would be Stella. She is. She thinks she's the queen here. So, so I'll try I mean, clearly to clearly she ball. is. Take her ball away. Yeah. Now you showed her, and now she's gonna think you want to play. <laughs> well, we are very pet keyword. friendly. Yeah, we're very pet friendly at our office. I personally bring three dogs of my own, um, and wow. she brings. Um, yeah, we have a, the welcoming committee when yeah. people come to the office. <laughs> well, personally, I think that dogs are the best welcoming committee. So kudos to that. In the Building Profits article, you also mentioned that you do personality assessments when you hire. Can you tell me a little bit about how you think that might contribute to a positive culture? Yeah, that was one of our uh, early PD sessions that we had here at DW Companies was we just we personality typed our entire team. So uh, the one that we use uh, is a four color uh, result. And so each of our team members were given either red, orange, yellow, or green. And then they just learn a lot about their personality. And, and we really bring that into who they show up as when they come to work, right. how they communicate, how they resolve conflicts, how they perceive time and tasks. Like, um, we really dig into that every time we host a professional development day. And we've even uh, we go so far as to actually implement it in part of our hiring process too. So 
Uh, you do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. that? So um, after they submit an application and they come in for an interview, we ask them to fill out the personality color indicator. Um, and not that that's going to like make or break like who we um, hire. However, we do know that if we have a whole group of reds, like another red to the group is probably not going to add the dynamics that we're looking for to be a successful team. Um, Those reds, reds um, like yeah. control and, you know, want right. to be the boss and be the leader and, and things like that. I have deadlines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have process, something called processes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Um, but, yeah. So, you know, and it also helps break the ice when we all are a part of that conversation that we know who um, is at the table then. We know a little bit about them. We know how to interact with them. Um, and it also, if there's, you know, maybe there's a little feeling or comments made like, well, what am I doing this for? This is dumb. If we feel that that's already giving us an indicator that they're not a person that's open to wanting to potentially grow right. within our team and be a part of like what we do here. Um, so informally, like getting some of that kind of feedback from them I would say that most people are like, oh, this is so unique. Like I've never done something like this. And you actually care who I am as a person and how I show up to work as part just, of this process. You just don't need a body here. That's crazy. Right. You know? <laughs> and we've gotten, uh, each of our guys wears, or our people on our team wear a, a sticker on their hard hat showing what color they are. So again, just as that reminder when they're out in the field or um, Katie and I and the people in the office have it on our computers, you know, kind of like what Katie said, a warning label. Like it, it's just a reminder that like when you're, in a situation or you're needing to communicate like, oh, that person does it a little bit different or sees it a little bit differently than I do. Like maybe they might not remember everything that we've taught them in our PD days, but they're going to remember that right. they're seeing this or thinking this a lot. Yeah, our colors are not the same. So we mm -hmm. might be perceiving this just slightly different. And that might be the source of our conflict at that moment. And like we said, we tell them and we train them like at that, that in the heat of the moment, if you're in conflict, and you see that they're not the same color, then that's a that's a an opportunity to take a breath and process your emotions a little bit before you're reacting because they might not even be seeing the fact that they're doing something in your eyes as wrong because they approach things differently. And you know, a lot of people are like, "Well, why didn't you use the DISC assessment or some of those others?" And we just really felt that the colors were powerful in the sense that. You can see it easily across the job site. You're not like, are you a D or a, you know, like it's very easy to identify. It is universal in every language that people identify with colors. And so it made most sense um, when we were start, started to build this within our own team that it felt like the right move um, in our industry. And uh, part of Culture Academy, uh, they learn how to implement the, or do the professional development day around colors. So they'll leave Culture Academy with um, knowing their entire team's colors. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the things that we walk, walk companies through is how to do that with their team. And not to mention on top of that, the walk throughout our like facility that you'll see um, posters and things on the walls with people's faces, with their colors and like best ways to approach those people literally sentence starters and there's our, you know, elementary education, right? Like, like these people will receive this statement so much better if you utilize this sentence starter or you utilize these word um, choices and literally helping people with those soft skills. And this um, has been not only successful amongst our team on the field and in the office, but we have seen the positive effects it's had on personal relationships for these people. Our industry has a bad rap. Like they, they work long hours. It's grueling. It's in the heat, um, and when they come home, sometimes maybe they're not always like in the best, you know, mood to like converse. And so helping them have that skill set to then go home and communicate at a much better level um, has really changed a lot of people's lives on our team as far as their relationships. I know guys that said, I will never get married again. I will never have another female in my life, you know, or, um, you know, people getting back together that had, you know, broke up because of really bad communication and are now happily married. And, you know, just, you know, seeing their personal growth 
is, you know, really, really exciting beyond just like how it has supported our company. So tell, tell me a little bit about, um, like work-life balance at, uh, DW. Do you want to talk about kind of the different teams that we have and how that works or do you want me to? You can talk about it. Okay. Um, so one of the questions we asked on our application is like, what is ideal set of hours weekly for you? And we asked that in like a genuine care, like, are this somebody that's looking for 45 hours a week? And then we put them on a crew that's 65 hours a week. And now they leave in, you know, a couple months because they can't handle it because they either have commitments or that work-life balance is super important to them. Um, we also have people that want the 60 hours. And if I gave them 45 hours, they wouldn't be satisfied. So we put that on the table to begin with on your job application. And we also know that if we're hiring somebody on a team, that's going to be on the 50 hour a week and they're looking for 40, like that's maybe not a good fit, or at least to have that conversation during the interview, then to get picked their brain about, if this is something that they really want. We hire for life. We, tie, we always say is that we're hiring people for long-term. Like we're not hiring to ever to fill a body. Um, it's really, 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 we want them to be a good fit for our company. Um, so we have teams out there that work um, probably that 45 to 50 hours. And then we have teams that are out there that are craving for 60 hours every week. And then a little bit in between. And we try to be really mindful of where we put people so that they're getting the desired hours that they want and have that work-life balance. Some of the other things that we will tell people is that I probably can't guarantee that you'll be at every baseball game of your child, but I can tell you that if you put, give me three or four of them, I will guarantee that you will get them, you will get them off. And I want you to be there because we also can't create that mindset that my dad was always gone or my mom was always working. Why the hell would I want to go into that industry? Right? Like we're not setting ourselves up for success if we're not having them be involved in um, their, their children's lives. We also give um, PTO time on the first day of school. So they have to submit their first day of school um, times if they have students in, in school. And we say, we'll pay you two hours, you get your child on the bus, you drop them off on the first day of school, you do whatever kind of works for you because it is so important for you to show that you're supporting your child's education. And also, that's been kind of, people just like are like blown away by that. I'm like, what does two hours PTO cost you? Nothing. And you're making such a statement. We also do a lot of like, like we mentioned earlier, like some of the community events that we're a part of and the, even some of our team building events, like we invite families to those because one, sometimes those are outside of working hours. They are paid for the events, but they're still another commitment. So we want the families to um, get connected with each other and find um connection with each other for when those hours do get long, they can lean in on each other and find help and make connections and build relationships between families as well. Mm -hmm. Like so, we all share, you know, like resources as far as like, Hey, like I have to, I have to work late. Like, can you pick up my child or can you this or whatever? Mm -hmm. We are always constantly trying to help support that, like within the structure of our organization, because we don't want to make it any harder on people. Like we want to make it easier on people so that we can all um, kind of be a support system for one another. You also mention in the article that you have a very low turnover rate. What other measurable outcomes do you see? Like what's your return on investment with this? We, you know, because people wanted to know at Con like what's the return on investment? Because this costs money, right? You're yeah. paying your people to go to a you're paying your people to shut down for the day and do professional development. So where, where's our return on investment? Well, in the three, we're getting to three and a half years now, um, zero OSHA violations, zero um, work comp claims, nearly zero uh, claims, I think, from the, from the equipment side. I think the one was a couple we had of hail damage, right? So kind of hard to... Um, <laughs> How hard to uh, yep. avoid those when you're, you know, caught on a job site when hail arrives. But I mean, those types of things, yeah, like it's hard to see immediately what that return on investment is, but you have to look at it from a big picture, that, that long standing point of that financial um, investment comes back 
in multiple, multiple waves. Um, you think about your insurance is so much cheaper because you don't have those claims, which then allows your premiums to stay down, which then allows you to be more competitive and get more jobs because you don't have the overhead that that's there. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard when people are focused on the, the dollar in the immediate, but you have to like step back and think about how all of those other things impact um, your overall p &L. And not to mention just the cost of turnover in general, like it costs a lot of time and hours and manpower to retrain and retrain and rehire and all the things. So I think the stats are like three to four months of like a person's salary. Yeah. It costs to, to lose somebody providing that they weren't a very vested long-time employee, then it's even more. So for those who want to enroll in your culture Academy, how would they do that? Yeah, we right now our culture Academy is going on now. Uh, we have talked about offering another cohort or two uh, next fall into winter. We've, we we kind of are staying away from the summer months just, of course, because of our industry and, and the uh, amount of time that the summer takes. But um, we are building the Culture Academy into a lot more than just one course. Um, it's We've learned a lot in this first Culture Academy that like there's- People want and need. <laughs> There's so many directions and so many like additional courses and resources that we can offer and, and offer resources that we already have available. Like, so it's just a matter of, again, trying to figure out what and how and when. And um, so when the time comes, it, you can just register on our website, therepurposeeducator.com. Um, we also have been given some feedback that some people want like a self-paced, mm -hmm. do it on your own, like record it. Don't the, don't have the lives, like just record the things and I'll go through that. And I think that is great for those that are accountable for themselves and can do that. Um, I think that the, the reds of the world, <laughs> but, <Right. and> the <laughs> <oranges>. <laughs> uh, but there's others that really need that connection to other companies, the connection to us in lives. And so you know, we've talked about like, will it be successful if it's, if we ran another cohort in June and, you know, that's kind of a mixed bag because it's the heat of the moment. And then are they going to do all of the things of implementation? Like, are they going to be able to stop in the heat of the moment, especially their first time and do a professional development day? Like, you know, there's some hesitation on our side um, because we desire impact. Like, yeah, we can put it out there right. and we can do it, um, but we want people to be successful in it. So that's where we kind of like are struggling as far as offering one another one right now. Yep. I think to meet the needs, um, we have talked about running multiple cohorts at the same time um, mm -hmm. through the fall and the winter. Um, and also we've started partnering with a couple of different organizations, a local large uh, equipment dealer that is finding value in what we're doing and saying, hey, we would like you to come start doing some in-person stuff with our customer base because we believe in helping this with this problem of mm -hmm. um, culture in uh, construction and the turnover and all of that stuff. But we also um, we also have partnered with an insurance company, like a general liability insurance company, okay. because they're seeing what the return on investment is from a from an insurance standpoint, mm -hmm. and they are like, yeah, I think we need you guys as a value add because. 95% of our customer race is in construction and, or in manufacturing. And this would be perfect fit for them to be able for us to say, oh, you're kind of struggling with that. Or you, I can see that you want to grow in this area and be able to say, hey, we've got this opportunity for you, um, whether they join it virtually or we um, have some in-person courses that happen on their at their facility. So, so lots coming up, uh, lots kind of looming as ideas, as like everything but... else we have done it just kind of we're waiting to see what people want and then we'll execute but definitely be looking for another culture academy cohort fall and winter mm -hmm. awesome well i feel like i could keep you guys here for hours and i, I don't want to do that so if there's is there anything else you want to say before we end i would say that no matter if you're going to take culture academy or not um 
join us on social media. There's lots of things that you can do that are small little shifts um, in your organization that can start that wheel turning for a better culture. Doesn't ha- It will not happen overnight. There is no magic wand. It's intentional work and it's constant little shifts that you have to make. And we share a lot on our social media and would just love to have you join along with our journey. Yeah, both at DW Companies and the Repurpose Educator. So uh, we're we're everywhere, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, all of the things. YouTube. Yep. Yes, of course. Everybody check out the links for this episode for all of DW Companies social media and repurpose educators and various links down there. Uh, Rye, Katie, I am huge fans of what you all are doing. Stella, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing as well. <laughs> really wants her ball. So <laughs> <It's> really, <laughs> <laughs> of course she does. There's bigger things in this podcast, right? <laughs> well, seriously, thank you both for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Perfect. Thank you thank so much you. for having us and, and showcasing us at ZFMA. Of course, it's my pleasure. Thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Voices of CFMA, sponsored by Old Republic Shorty. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe and share it on social media. And if you're interested in learning more about the Construction Financial Management Association, check out cfma.org. Once again, I'm your host, Sal Marino, and I will see everyone back here next month. Thanks.